Our plan for today is just to have a sort of three-part event. So we're going to open with our author, Rhonda Robinson Thomas, um, who will give us an introduction to the book, the project. And she'll be the she'll be on screen with Hillary Green. I'll introduce them both in just a second. Then about at about 540, we're going to invite three people who collaborated on this project with Professor Thomas to join the two of them. And they'll share their experience. One of the marvelous things about this book is the way it documents how a public scholarship project can include students, community partners, um, can be a real community project led by a scholar in collaboration with the scholar. Um, our author, Rhonda Robinson Thomas, is the Calhoun Lemon Professor of Literature in the English Department at Clemson University. She's the author of Claiming Exodus, A Cultural History of Afro-American Identity, 1774 to 1903, from Baylor University Press. And she's also the co-editor of a book called The South Carolina Roots of African-American Thought, a Reader, which she co-edited with a University of Iowa alum, I'm proud to say, Susanna Ashton. Um, the project that we'll hear about today was supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and by the Whiting Foundation, where Rhonda was a public fellow. And I want to say, send a special shout out to the executive director of the Whiting Foundation, Daniel Reed, for introducing us. Rhonda will be joined today by Professor Hillary Green, who is a professor in the Department of Gender and Race Studies at the University of Alabama. Professor Green is the author of Educational Reconstruction, African-American Schools in the Urban South. And she's also the leader of a fantastic digital humanities project called The, ha the Hallowed Grounds that I warmly recommend to you all. Um, with that, I'm going to highlight Professor Thomas and Professor Green and off we go. Thank you all so much for being with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today for the launch of my book. And I'm so thrilled uh, to have some of the contributors uh, with us and also Professor Green uh, to facilitate this conversation. I am gonna start by reading a few pages from the opening chapter, The Calling, that really uh, talks about how this project went from an idea uh, to a public history project. And this is from pages 56, uh, over to about page uh, 59. For nearly three years, I searched for some trace of the convicts who built Clemson. I had written the South Carolina Department of Corrections, SDCDC, hoping they had established an archive or knew what had happened to the documents. I soon learned that the SCDC did not keep historical criminal records. I also scoured Clemson trustees' earliest annual reports and correspondence, but their notes focused on facts, how many convicts they leased, how much money they spent for the convicts' care, how many structures the convicts built, but no names or ages, just references that reflected the fact that these South Carolina convicts have been subjected to involuntary servitude, permissible by the 13th Amendment, because they had been convicted of crimes. Clemson archivist initially directed me to Jerry Reel's The High Seminary, where he mentions convict laborers about 20 times in the chapter that relates the university's founding. But I needed to know their names to discover the circumstances that led them to be subjected to post-Reconstruction slavery. Each man was somebody's son, brother, husband, uncle, or neighbor. After listening to the stories about the challenges the men in my family had faced growing up during the Jim Crow era in South Carolina, I had no doubt that life for these men had become even more difficult after they were classified as convicts. Just as I was about to give up my search, a Clemson archivist suggested that I contact the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. After learning I could make a query via email, I sent a request on October 8th 2013, asking for information regarding convicts contracted to Clemson between 1890 and 1899, the date 
of the last petition for convict submitted to the state legislature by Clemson trustees that I had discovered thus far. The next morning, I received a response from the archivist Marion C. Chandler, who wrote, the South Carolina Department of Archives and History does have a list of prisoners contracted out to Clemson College between 1890 and 1889. The list includes the prisoner's names, prison number, date sent to Clemson, what happened to him, discharged from Clemson, returned to Columbia, sent to Rock Hill, Winthrop, or died. The most important item in the list is the prisoner's number. With the prisoner's number, you will have easy access to the record of the prisoner. The central registers of prisoners are arranged by prison number, and they give a great deal of information about each prisoner. The information includes age, race, occupation, physical description, where born, crime, and when and where convicted. A few days later, I carefully opened the large white mailing envelope from the archive and pulled out copies of pages filled with prison numbers, names, and notes neatly penned in elegant script about convicts who had been assigned to work at Clemson during the last decade of the 19th century. I whispered the first name and notes on the list. 9828, Carolina Richardson escaped July 13, 1890. Some had resisted. Halfway down the page, 9377, Pink Floyd. I smiled at the name that would later be linked with a popular English rock band. While scanning that page of the register, listing the first 30 six convicts assigned to Clemson in May and June, 1890, I formulated questions. I noted eight had escaped from the work site or from the penitentiary. Eight were discharged from Clemson or from the penitentiary. Some were returned to the penitentiary or somewhere else. Most names had no notation. Why not? Did they work at Clemson or not? I soon learned that the majority of the public records regarding convict labor and the building of Clemson University have been sitting in the state archive, courthouses for more than a century. I slipped down to my colleague Angela Naomu's office located on the same floor of Strode Tower. I found him, I whispered, holding out the registers of convicts for her to see. About 10 days later, I drove two hours from Clemson to the archive in Columbia to examine the registers of convicts and the descriptive roles that contain demographic and court details about them. I quickly realized the archivist had underestimated the number of convicts who were assigned to the Clemson College work detail. As I turned the pages of the register, I discovered the state penitentiary had assigned convicts to the college through 1915, not 1899. The total number was nearly 700 far more than the 50 I had expected to find. I also learned that the penitentiary operated large farms where hundreds of convicts were forced to work like enslaved field hands, planting and harvesting crops for the state. Locating the list of convict registers was the easiest part of the process of recovering their penitentiary records. The registers were organized by the year the convicts were assigned to Clemson. The court workers were organized by county. Although the state archive housed most of the court records, some counties had kept their records. Other records had been destroyed by fire, were lost, or were missing. I started by recording details about the convicts from some of the counties closest to Clemson, namely Anderson, Greenville, Oconee, Pickens, and Spartanburg. Using the prison number for each person listed in the register, I searched the descriptive roles recorded in oversized brown ledgers that included demographic details, sentencing information, release, parole, pardon dates, escape, recapture notes, and descriptions of distinct body features such as burn scars, missing teeth, or large moles. Some scholars I had consulted suggested that many of the black men would have been arrested for loitering simply minding their own business while standing on a street corner or walking down a road. But most of the convicts assigned to Clemson to work detail were convicted of some form of larceny, often stealing food, clothes, or livestock. A few were white. Most were under the age of 25, but one was a teenager. Wade Foster's name appeared on the seventh page of the registers for convicts assigned to Clemson College on August 1st, 1891. Notes indicate 
he was released from the work detail on January 4th, 1892. I found him in the descriptive role using his prison number 10565. As I ran my finger across the page, I added his occupation, laborer, to my Excel sheet. Then I moved to the next column for age, stopped, stared at the finely pinned number. I whipped out my iPhone, snapped a picture of the page, and then swiped my fingers across the screen to enlarge the image, 13. Way Foster was a 13-year-old, black-haired, black-eyed, black-skinned, four-foot, eight and three-quarters inch boy when he was committed to the state penitentiary. He'd been sentenced to six months at hard labor after being convicted of housebreaking in the daytime in Spartanburg, South Carolina, stealing $6 worth, about $173 in 2019 currency, a boy's clothing, a toy drum, and a pillowcase from his neighbor's home. 13, like the 13th Amendment that made his incarceration possible through its provision for involuntary servitude, quote, as a punishment for the crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, end quote. 13th, like the documentary produced by Anna DuVernay that locates the roots of mass incarceration in Wade Foster's lifetime, a 13-year-old boy from my hometown had helped build the university that had hired me to teach early African-American literature. About two years earlier, when I had asked Clemson University then president James Barker to authorize a new study of the institution's history, he had refused, but encouraged me to pursue my research interests. How would I break the news of this unexpected discovery to the Clemson community and the public? On April 17th, 2014, the Greenville News published a front page feature story titled, Research Honors the Lives of Convicts Who Built Clemson, about the labor of Wade Foster and other members of the predominantly African-American state convict crew leased by Clemson trustees, which at the time had included Governor Pin, Pit, Pitchfork Ben Tillman. The story began, he was 13. My research inquiry had become a public history project. Rhonda, thank you so much for just reading that. I was, when I read this and I will say this, <laughs> so happy to have read and just to, I was like, uh-huh, yep, yep. How a recovery process become an obsession. <laughs> How the obsession just grows and blooms, but it all starts with a simple question. And your question was so simple. And I was just wondering, you still idea of the project, but how did you go from the project to the publication? What was that process like? And what were some of the questions guiding you along the way? And we got from here, especially your organization, the call and response, like how do you, like, how's that formulation come about? Well, um, this project was, was really interesting because it started with that simple question. Um, I didn't know anything about the university's history when I arrived at Clemson in 2007 as a postdoc. And on my very first day at work, one of my colleagues, Mike Lemahue, uh, was assigned to show me around campus. And so I got to campus and he took me to my building, our building, the library, the classroom building, it was like in this little triangle, I was very happy that I wasn't gonna have to be walking over that huge campus uh, to get where I needed to go. And then he said, I need to show you something. And we walked to the center of campus. And if you've read the book, you know that he took me to the plantation house. And I was like, oh my goodness, where am I? Uh, why is there a plantation house in the middle of this campus? And he turned to me and smiled and said, that's John C. Calhoun's Fort Hill Plantation House. And I thought, Lord have mercy. You know, I came back to South Carolina to work on a plantation. Um, he didn't know that I hated historic plantations. I had had really bad experiences on them, um, but I had to quickly recover and get myself together and, and get in my African-American lit class and my American lit class that fall, took my students on a tour and there was no mention of slavery or enslaved people. Um, I asked the tour guide when I went back by myself and he said that subject was too controversial. And um, I, I thought, well, this is a university. How can slavery be too controversial to talk about, especially since we are located on a plantation and not just any plantation, but John C. Calhoun's plantation, yeah. right? 
you know, one of the foremost proponents of slavery in the 19th century. So my first question was, what do we know? What do we have about enslaved people? Um, and if we can learn something, can we at least include that in the tour? So one day um, on one of those tours, um, Will Hyatt, who was the director of historic properties mentioned these inventories. And I was like, we have names? Their names in the, in the archive? So I went flying over to the archive um, and found these two inventories, uh, 50 names in 1854 when the plantation was sold from mother to son. Mm -hmm. And then again in 1865, 139 names. And I thought, well, if we have names, um, then we need to start searching for these people. Um, we need to include these stories in the history of the university. Um, and so from that simple question of what do we know about enslaved people, as I was searching for them, all of a sudden there were the sharecroppers who were there during reconstruction. And then somebody said, oh yeah, and by the way, some black convicts built Clemson. And then somebody said, Oh yeah, and when the college opened, they hired black people to cook and to clean and to farm and it just kept going. And then one day I'm looking in a picture book and I saw Duke Ellington smiling back at me. And I thought, what was Duke doing here? And then found out that Clemson started bringing these big name musicians to perform. Initially we thought it started in 18, I mean, sorry, in 1939 with Jimmy Lunsford. And then one of my colleagues, Maya Hislop, found a little tiny newspaper article that said a Negro orchestra came in, in 1920. Um, and then, you know, I came to Clemson and I kind of heard about Harvey Gantt who desegregated Clemson in, 18, in uh, 1963. And then I thought, but what, af what about after Harvey, right? What, what about who came after Harvey Gantt? And so Lucinda Brawley who ends up marrying Harvey Gantt is mentioned and that was it. And I thought there must have been more students. So we started looking. And so all of a sudden from that tiny little question about what about the enslaved people, there was history that starts in 1825 and goes to 1972, which is where that project um, originally stopped. So there was a history of African-Americans and there was a reliance on black labor for Clemson's existence, that, that this university was reliant on the labor of black people for its existence. And that was completely missing from the narrative. Yeah, and I so appreciate your response because one of the things your book does and also my research and other researchers too, it's something about being a black scholar, a black woman, we look for names. We look for the people, the marginalized of the marginalized. And what I thought was interesting your t on the the response that the to slavery is too taboo <laughs> to talk about. Well, yeah. the history of African Americans on these campuses predate the opening. What is so you're revealing this unearthing of, if anything, the Black history that was always there, always for without that, you would not have the institution. Right. So, one of the things I was like to think about, and your book really pushes what can we do, go, especially with some institutes want to feel good stories. They want to stop in 1865 with emancipation as if nothing else happened after that. Mm -hmm. How do you see your book fitting in this larger national, and I would say even international, mm -hmm. investigation of institutions of higher ed reckoning with this long racial past, I would say from the slavery to the present and moving forward? Yeah, yeah. When I was, I was, I've been thinking about, you know, Clemson did join University Studying Slavery Consortium. And that consortium um, started at the University of Virginia. And it was initially um, some colleges and universities in Virginia said, hey, we have kind of this shared legacy of slavery in the university. Uh, let's get together, share some ideas. Um, and then Georgetown University heard about it, wanted to join. And finally, they just opened it up to anybody. And so it went from you know, a, a state to kind of a regional, to a national, to a global. Okay. And now there are universities around the world that are part of university studying slavery. And so as we have gotten together and talked, um, we found that these, these legacies are variations on the same theme, 
right? That even like Clemson wasn't founded during the antebellum period. Clemson is founded in 1899, 89 rather, but because we're founded on a plantation because um, black labor is so essential for the university's development and success, um, that, that story, that history of slavery and its legacies is still very much a part of, of, of who we are. It's in everybody's mm -hmm. DNA. You know, it's in, it's in the nation's DNA mm -hmm. and then it gets passed on to these universities, whether you come in the colonial period and the antebellum mm -hmm. period or reconstruction or post reconstruction, it doesn't matter where you fall along the historical timeline, mm -hmm. you are going to be impacted by slavery and its legacies. And so, you know, I started in the antebellum period because of the plantation history that we have, um, because of John C. Calhoun uh, and his connection to people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and others who have universities associated with them. We have found that uh, John C. Calhoun wanted his own university. Um, he dies in 1850, doesn't get to realize his dream, but it lives on in his daughter. And so Anna, who marries our founder, Thomas Green Clemson, is able to realize that dream her father had before Thomas Green Clemson comes into the family, right? He's the last man standing and is able to make it happen. But, you know, our history is rooted in the antebellum period. And so the other thing that I think happens is sometimes we stop. You mentioned kind of stopping, right, at the end of Reconstruction or stopping in 1865 when the Civil War ends. And we don't talk about the legacy, mm -hmm. uh, the story of Black labor at Clemson during its early years is a story that's replicated all over this country. Black people are the ones who are cooking in the dining halls, right? They're cleaning the dormitories. They're doing the lawn work. They are the laundry workers. They are in the segregated cooperative education um, uh, system, extension system rather, right? They're there. They're always there, but they are invisible. And for some reason, people not only thought slavery was taboo, but they thought these segregated workforces were taboo as well. That invisible labor that made these universities and colleges possible, nobody wanted to talk about the help. Right? Except, they were just kind of, right? <laughs> except to make fun it. of them in the yearbooks, like you talk <laughs> yeah, about yeah. that shared yeah, history. Like that, you know? right? We got the same thing. And so if yeah. you put all these stories uh, side by side, you are going to see these through lines, right? Uh, where Many universities and colleges have similar histories. It depends on where you are regionally, right? Or, or how it plays out in the North, South, West, it does not matter. Very similar stories. And this is because of the history of our nation. You know, not the history of the South or the North, it's the history of America that gets played out all over this country. And then you see like in England, we've got some sister institutions there um, that have that legacy of slavery, right? You know, they are the ones early on in the transatlantic slave trade that are benefiting. And those slave traders are investing in those colleges and universities. And yeah. they have similar stories of that post reconstruction, Jim Crow, their version in Europe right? It's a very similar story. It just plays out differently. And now all of a sudden, everybody's waking up mm -hmm. and saying, we need to acknowledge this history. We need to honor this history. We need to think about restorative justice, mm -hmm. right? You know, we have descendants. We're going to have a descendant of an enslaved family on the call tonight, Eric Young, who's going to talk about what it was like yeah. to find out he was a descendant. You know, what do we do? You know, yeah. it's not enough for me to just tell the, you know, right, we're recovering the history, but what's next? Exactly. And that's something that I really appreciate about your book. And one of the things I think more projects need to do, because we talk about it as an academic, as this doesn't have traction for the legacy. Do these are legacy students for those of slavery, but also convict leasing of the help that no one talks about? What do we do in the presence once we know? And and one of the things I appreciate, not only this academic and recovering names, you now are part of the history of African-Americans yeah. at the campus. <laughs> and as you're going through, I'm like, thank you for telling your story. So I wanted to 
think about that challenge because I know for me, it's already hard enough to research the history of slavery and its legacies at your own employer. And when you're in a building named after one of the major <laughs> slavers on the campus, and you have to go and teach. What is it about to write this, your narrative as a part of this long history that you are now a part of? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a sixth generation South Carolinian. And when I started this project, uh, proud South Carolinian, um, my family's roots go deep in the state. Uh, my family did not let Ben Tillman run them out of the state. Uh, folks didn't start leaving until like the 60s. Um, so I talk about that with my students and say we were we were one of the families that stayed. You know, there were hundreds of thousands that left, but the Robinsons and the Williams and the Earls, you know, and the Henrys, we stayed. Um, so I think because I am a South Carolinian, I felt a greater connection to this history, um, especially as I learned things like, you know, the convicted laborers came from all over the state, mm -hmm. almost every county of the state. And I'm looking down the list for my family names, you know, to see possible relatives. Uh, and I still need to follow up on some of that. So I'm looking in all of these black spaces, trying to find my family. And then this weird thing happened. Um, my my great great grandmother, paternal great great grandmother. I I grew up knowing her as Lucretia Earl, and as I started this research, I realized I didn't know her birth name, and so I called my cousin Charles, who is like the family historian, and uh, said, "Hey Charles, you know what was Lucretia's birth name?" He called another brother. They got it for me, and he said Wanamaker. So I wrote down Wanamaker in my family tree and went back to my research. One day I'm reading some of the notes that one of my research assistants, uh, Edith Dunlap, had prepared for me on the convicts. And I'm going down the page and I see Wanamaker. And I thought, that name sounds familiar. Um, where have I heard that name before? And as I'm sitting there, I realize that that's the name of one of Clemson's trustees. His, the first trustees, they call them successor trustees now. And I thought, no, no, <laughs> no I, I, I cannot be related to this family. So I, I did a little searching, found out that the South Carolina Wanamakers were from the same area in the state where Lucretia had come from. And I'm getting a little nervous. And um, I've had DNA testing done, went to ancestry.com, Pop Wanamaker Ann and one of John Wanamaker's family members popped up in my family tree. And so all of a sudden, this wasn't just me documenting African Americans in Clemson history. I have become part of the story mm -hmm. and never expected that to happen. Also, like with Wade Foster, one of the reasons I decided to read that excerpt is because when I saw 13 year old Wade Foster and saw that he was from Spartanburg, South Carolina and thinking about me being born in South Carolina in Spartanburg, the same place where this child was born who was assigned to build my college. All of these, these threads of the South Carolina story and Clemson University and my own life and my family's life um, began to be woven together so that I was not just, it was not just an academic pursuit, mm -hmm. yeah. but it was a recovery and a reconnection of my own self to my home state that I had to leave when I was two years old, not because my daddy and mommy wanted to leave, but because of Ben Tillman's policies finally caught up with my family and my dad couldn't find a job as a teacher, a college educated teacher in that segregated system Daddy couldn't find a job that paid him enough to take care of his wife and his two children. And so we left. And now here I am coming back to recover this story that Ben Tillman never wanted anybody to know about. He never wanted people to know, I believe, Clemson's indebtedness, not just to the convicted laborers, but to all of these black folks who made this university run like an engine, right? All of this labor that creates this community, you know, that he doesn't want us there as students or faculty or as administrators, but never in a million years would a South Carolina born 
African-American female scholar be back on that campus, recovering the history, changing the narrative, asking the university, call my name Clemson. That first call is for the university to acknowledge this history and to not just acknowledge it, but to respond to it. And that's one of the things I love throughout this and the inclusion of Eric and uh, Monica and others who will bring on in about five more minutes or so is that you really show that the personal is political and you make, and it's throughout this and it's just woven in, in a way that it's a South Carolina, it's a microcosm of America. It's the nation, it's the state and undergirding that black labor, that history and going through, but also too, it's a recovery and a recovery that's necessary because it wasn't talked about. It was, it's not being taught. It, so one of the things I know personally, I am teaching this book in the spring. Mm -hmm. My students at Davidson, we're dealing with this, I'm on sabbatical at Davidson College for the semester and my students are looking at after slavery. Mm -hmm. What happened with the college's legacy with the surrounding towns in terms of education and churches? So I know for me as an instructor, what this is gonna do, but what do you think about this book? How do you think it'd be incorporating the classrooms? But the second question follow up is how do you think communities, mm. this particular communities where there are institutions of higher ed of any sort, because you really show the rootedness, the land, it doesn't matter when it, the school emerges. How might those communities use that if they're starting the process? Mm. How might your book be an instructor's manual in a way of how to engage it, how to talk about it and change the conversation? I think I would have to say, um, my strategy is always in community. Um, that Call My Name, we adopted um, the Call My Name uh, title for the project and then for the book and the book employs call and response mm -hmm. um, because I realized early on that the traditional approach to research was not gonna work. I would definitely need to go to the archive, right? I would definitely need to go on ancestry.com and create a thousand family trees. And I have many, many family trees, right? I would definitely have to go to conferences and network with scholars all over the world. I mean, I'm like checking all the boxes and I'm still saying something's missing. And I thought, What's missing is the people whose stories I'm researching. They have family, they have descendants. As I got to know the Clemson community and learned that many of the descendants of enslaved people, many of the descendants of people who had worked as wage laborers at Clemson still live locally. And I thought they need a place at the table, right? They need to be with me. I am honored above measure to be able to be in a position to recover these stories. However, one of the things I insisted, the first voice that you see in my book is not my own. It's Eric Young's voice and you're gonna get to hear from him. I tried to have a descendant at the, at the back but they wouldn't let me. So I snuck in uh, a voice of one of our alums in that last chapter, you know, the yeah. last words of the book are yeah. call my name Clemson always, but right before that you hear dot, <laughs> you know, um, at that last uh, public uh, event that we had in March before the pandemic shut us down. So I'm constantly looking for ways to create spaces where people can tell their own stories. Like, I feel like I'm a facilitator, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to play the role of a scholar, but I'm also going to create spaces where people can tell their own stories in their own voices with this little editing. Those, those parts of the book, I'm like, light touch, punctuation, <laughs> grammar, but please, you know, I said, you can tear my work up, but those spaces are for people to share their stories. So I think one of the the ways I hope this book will be used is in public history um, classes, right? You know, some people had asked like, how do you all do what you do? And so one of the things that is in the book and I hope folks will find it interesting is there a lot of process. Like when I talked about going to the archive, I tell you everything that I did, things not to do, dead ends, you know? And so I tried to fill it with the how-to of public history projects, right? And this is from an English professor's uh, English, you know, professor's perspective. I'm not a historian, I'm a storyteller. 
Um, also, I think it could work in uh, books uh, like a common read for uh, first year students who are coming into these universities and trying to engage with this history. How do you do that? Who do you need to be reading? What do you need to be doing? If you are involved in or interested in these projects and students all over the country are really pushing universities, right, to be involved, how do you do that? So I think because my research assistants, two of them, uh, Emily Border, uh, actually three, Emily Border, um, Brendan McNeely, um, Edith Dunlap have, you know, have chapters in this book where they're talking about the research that they did. Um, and now they're a part of this conversation, right? I wanted them at the table. Um, also, um, I think um, in just American history and American literature, African-American literature courses, I think this book works very well. Uh, and especially in African-American literature where the community, right, is so important uh, from the very beginning and you see kind of the reconstruction of community at Clemson University uh, in this book uh, where, you know, the person who steps in and actually gets the funding for me to do the work that I'm doing is an African-American alum, James Bostick Jr., right? It was not the administration, you know, it was not my department chair, although all of them tried to do the best that they could the person who was able to finally intervene was a person, you know, connected to the university, but from the community who went to the provost and said, you need to invest in Dr. Thomas's work. I will match, right, match my donation. And then let's double it to make sure she can keep going. So I think those are ways that the campus can get involved. But I hope that universities will also sponsor readings of this book for the communities mm -hmm. because the community voice is so central to the work that we all are doing. And I tried to show that in this book, how you privilege that voice and invite them to come to the table as equals. You know, there's no hierarchy for me. You know, I'm not, you know, the scholar and community people are down here. No, we're all together exchanging ideas and creating this history, recovering this history, thinking about what's next together. And I think this book can show how one model, right? Mm -hmm. Just one model of how that could work in university communities around the world. And I think you agree. And I liked how you brought people to the table. So I would like to inter um, bring in three of the other uh, contributors who I enjoyed reading about. And I was like, this is such a great model to have. So I would like to have Monica, Thomas, and Eric share their thoughts about their involvement in this lovely project. Good evening to all. I'm Monica Williams Hudgens. And um, this project actually for me started back in about 2014 when I was recommended to uh, Rhonda by her brother and her sister-in-law um, had met me and said, hey, we have one of Strom Thurmond's Black granddaughters right here in Columbia, South Carolina. Would you like to basically have a conversation with her? And from that in February of 2015, um, Clemson had Race in the University series going and I was invited to speak. Um, it was interesting because I guess if my mother wouldn't have um, passed away in um, February 2013, I, it probably would have been her speaking mm. um, at that point. But as her descendant, as her daughter, I came graciously and wanted to share some of my mother's story basically. So that was the beginning of a relationship. And then um, about four years later, I actually moved to South Carolina in 2015. And uh, Rhonda asked me um, about writing something for Call My Name. And I was kind of very reluctant because it's like, well, what do I have to contribute? I'm not a South Carolinian. You know, I was born in Los Angeles, California, spent 25 years of my life in Seattle, Washington. Well, it is through research and reconciliation, which that's what my piece was on when I came to Clemson in 2015, was the re um, recon reconciling my differences between my lineage and my legacy. 
which really provoked a lot of thought about who I was, what I was. Now, it's interesting because my mother wrote a book called Dear Senator, that was S.E. Mae Washington Williams, and she put something in the dedication that will always be with me, and that in that dedication, she was challenging her her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren to seek and know who you are. What are you about? Where did you come from? Uh, and stop saying you're from Los Angeles. <laughs> but the truth is, as I began to unearth things and came and lived in the culture here, and it was interesting because we moved here around May 2015, and on our um, 39th wedding anniversary, um, Mother Emmanuel, the nine wonderful, precious souls that were murdered um, by a white supremacists um, hit me after two months of being here. But after quite a bit of research, I would learn that it's not just about Strom Thurmond and him being in me, but what about Carrie Butler? Mm -hmm. That was my mother's biological mother. And that book was written in 2005 and not a lot of thought or research was put on that because I really didn't know her because my grandmother was her sister. There's a lot of confusion as to even different names. So this title, Call My Name, who am I? I'm, I know for sure I am a Thurman. I am a Washington. I am a Williams. And um, where did Washington come from? My grandmother's last name was Butler. Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting. What is in a name? Mm. What is in a name is who you are, where you came from. So I, we should call for um, the names. And that has been my contribution is to think more deeply and um, sincerely about how do we get this out? So we have uh, these names. And when I was very young, I was very fascinated when I was about 15 years old with X. Um, the Black Muslim movement in Los Angeles was very big. So Malcolm X, and I met a lot of brother X's and sister X's. Well, that's what's in my heart. I want to find the X. Who was the X? So as this collaboration continues, um, it is in my soul, day and night, to finding out who I am. So most recently, I found a great, great, grandfather, which would be the father of my maternal grandmother and aunts and uncles. His name is Jasper Butler. That's a new name for me. So finding out more about Jasper Butler, Jasper Butler was 10 when he was emancipated from slavery. And I'm like, how sobering that now I'm not Los Angeles. I'm not Seattle. I'm becoming a South Carolinian. My life is rooted here. And my father's from Savannah, Georgia. So even learning more about him, it's funny how a coast can disconnect you, but when you come and you connect, then all of a sudden you're a part of it. Now we figured, well, my married name is Hudgens. So at least that part of me, well, the Hudgens told me they came from um, Tennessee. Well, in fact, at a funeral a few years back, I found out from an aunt, from my husband's aunt, that no, they're from Anderson, South Carolina. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing. It's a, an awakening and saying you are South Carolinian. So that is my contribution that I am continuing um, to add. I call it my little piece pathway to transformation because it is everything that we think we might be or have been, or, you know, what our actual roots are, are very different when you get into the work mm -hmm. of finding those things out. And so I'm wanting to go deeper and find out everything I possibly can. And for my children and my grandchildren that you guys are South Carolinian at heart. Mm -hmm. So that's my piece that I contributed of how that path way has been laid out and it has taken all, I never in my life wanted to end up in South Carolina because I was discriminated at a cafe in Orangeburg. My parents went to state and they came to a homecoming from Savannah. And um, the waiter let us know we couldn't sit at the tables. You can order to go. 
So I remember that because I remember crying afterwards and feeling so um, less than that I couldn't sit for an order to go. So it's been real and not understanding as a child why I couldn't drink at certain fountains, why I had to go to certain bathrooms, why I had to go around to the back when there was a perfectly good bathroom right there. So that's what I'm seeking to uncover. And I really endorse call my name. What is in a name? It may be everything to some of us. So that's my, my goal is to continue the search of calling the names for. Thank you so much. Eric, can we hear from you? Hello, everyone. Uh, absolutely. Can you all see me? Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Young, and I am a 1995 uh, graduate of Clemson University. And I am also a direct descendant of Tam Thomas and Francis Brewster who were workers, uh, enslaved workers for, um, at the plantation. Um, their iconic uh, picture is utilized um, throughout Clemson University pertaining to black history or uh, any other type of event centered around blacks. Um, meeting Dr. Uh, Thomas was by chance, and it was almost like a surprise discovery. Um, I started my research back in 2014 after hearing my grandmother uh, talk about how far our family had come. And it was something about the way she said it that made me, it, it perked me, it, it, it poked at me because I couldn't, I mean, I understood that, but I think that she was looking at the totality of seeing um, not only her children, her grandchildren, and now her great grands do different things and do go on to do um, world renowned things. And, you know, for her, it was amazing because she started working, um, you know, at, in, I think it was around the 10th grade for her mother who could no longer work. She was able to take her job as a teenager and uh, to support the family. And so to see um, us doing all these different things, she, she spoke about that in a way that just kind of poked and nudged at me. And it began um, messing with me as I rode back from South Carolina to where I currently live in Charlotte. Um, and, you know, I began to, figure it out, I began to do some research and I called her back and I started saying, do you know who this is? Who, who is this to you? And she began to say, well, that's my grandmother or that, you know, that's, that's such and such and such. And so that from that point on, you know, I, I, I just started gathering information, started going to places like um, Strom Thurmond building, you know, all these other different places, trying to get the information, talking to other family members. And I ran into Dr. Thomas um, actually being invited. She, Dr. Thomas had set, had a meeting with a cousin of mine and somehow or another, that cousin got word that I was actually doing some research on the family and invited me just to come and sit in. I thought I was just, you know, okay, I'm going to sit and just listen and take it all in. And maybe it might help what I'm doing or, put me on a different path. And my cousin spoke and she gave some, you know, some history. And then Dr. Thomas looked at me and said, okay, um, so who are you? And I said, my name is Eric Young. And I told her um, that we were, you know, kin. And I said, I'm a 1995 graduate of Clemson University. And she just froze. <laughs> she said that you, you're kidding me. And I was like, no. <laughs> she said, you, you are, do, do you, <laughs> she, it's almost like she, I didn't know that our paths crossed and I didn't know that what she was looking for was what I had already started. I had just begun my journey. And um, we smiled and, and 
she said she felt chills and I felt chills and it was like just one of those moments. And so um, I began to share and I began to share with my family and we began to dig in and, and figure this thing out and how um, Thomas, the legacy of Thomas and Francis or Franny uh, Frewster, um, you know, has or is a bigger part of what, how we are, who we are today. And, um, you know, never, never would imagine that that was the history because in college, I didn't even know. Um, my great grandmother did a um, kind of, I guess his name was, a re it was a researcher from, on behalf of Clemson University by the last name of Megason. And he uh, was going around the community uh, trying to piece together um, history and and he actually spoke to my great grandmother and uh, before she passed in 1991 or 92 and um, those recordings when I started my research everyone said that there are some recordings down in the basement of the library that you might be able to figure it out find some information lo and behold those were the recordings. I was able to hear my great grandmother's voice talk about a lot of the, her up gro uh, her growing up, um, how Clemson, or at the time it was called Calhoun, um, how that played a part, um, and how how they interacted with with um, other races and whatnot. So um, this has been just a tremendous experience. I really appreciate Dr. Thomas for giving uh, my family an opportunity to just share their story and, um, and, and, and to share it from a perspective of not only as a descendant, but also as a, a graduate of Clemson University. Oh, thank you. Thomas, can you share your thoughts? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first off want to say those stories are super, super powerful and just to really set um, the work that's being done. And it's it's because of the Jim Bostics and the Eric Youngs and people like that, that I'm only in this position that I'm in today um, to be able to even attend Clemson University. Um, so I'll start my story as I am born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, grew up in the predominantly Black areas of Columbia. Loved, loved on my upbringing and everything. Um, and I was trying to decide on where I was going to go to college. And so trying to figure out that college decision is always tough, um, bigger school, smaller school. I only had heard of Clemson University because of athletics. And that was pretty much my only, my only thing. I, my mom was a big Clemson fan growing up. And so decided to go to Clemson. Um, and when I first arrived on campus, um, I had initially gone on to a minority experience, um, accepted student stay. And that was kind of my first step into the university. I was like, okay, this is going to be great. Like really excited to kind of step in and, and get this full experience. Um, and so then I get to campus as a scared, shy 17 year old because my birthday was that week and I have no idea what's happening. Um, and I am nervous because one, there are not a lot of people that look like me. Um, I go, went to Columbia High School in Columbia, South Carolina, which is predominantly black. Um, there were only a couple white students in the entire school. Um, and so trying to figure out things. I'm trying to figure out my schedule. So it's the first day of class. Um, and I go into my 1220 philosophy class and it's in Hardin Hall. And I don't know too much about Hardin Hall. It's um, primarily like brick building and it looks pretty old or fits in with the, the rest of the buildings that Clemson University has. Um, and I walked in and of course it's already intimidating. I'm coming from a black school, um, a smaller school um, and being in a huge collegiate setting, I'm just not really ready for. So I walk into the class and I look around and I take my seat at the front um, and I look around and see that I'm the only black student there. Um, and so I'm okay, this is, this is gonna be okay, trying to navigate this and everything. And I continue on um, with classes and everything like that. And it's crazy, I just found this memory back in November of 2017, um, I was on the University Undergraduate Student Senate because I got super involved in my undergraduate career. Um, and that's where I met Dr. Thomas um, and she had came and presented to the Senate and talked about Clemson's African-American history. Um, and I couldn't believe it. Um, I could believe it, but the fact that it was not introduced to me as I was coming into the university 
was the most unbelievable part of it. So much untold history that needed to be told. And so we go on to her African-American history tour that she puts on um, for the university. Um, and I completely, it completely changed the way I looked at campus. Um, going to Hardin Hall and going back to that building where I first stepped in um, and being that only black student in the class and feeling like I had to carry on the weight of black America in my entire, um, in my entire life in that one 50 minute class, I learned that convict laborers that were younger than me built that historic building. Um, and in my part of the, the contribution, it's called a seat at the table. And I think um, as someone who I'm very candid and vulnerable, I struggle with imposter syndrome and trying to feel like I belong in spaces. I'm, my life's work, I think is I'm constantly searching for that seat at the table, um, constantly find out what the table is or should we revolutionize the table? I'm not even sure. Um, but to learn about Simon Davis, um, the, specific, um, the specific child, um, to put it plainly, who worked on that um, building, I could not believe that I was going to a school where I was afforded in many privileges to just be there, um, to be in the spaces that I was, being in a, a lot of leadership positions, working to end systemic racism on campus and working with administration and, and being a, a voice for a lot of Black students on campus. I could not believe that Simon Davis did not get that opportunity. And I was walking the same places that he built. Um, and so that was a huge, huge, big, big thing for me. And so I'm really glad it was ended up being named a seat at the table because I think, like I said, it's something I'm still constantly trying to, to find, trying to work with, trying to understand. Um, and something that I will continue to, and even as an alum being graduated in 2020, my goal is to not just leave Clemson, but to be involved in this place that I love, but I also critique a lot. And I also want to be the best. And I think we need to rebrand what love is and change it and make it to be this place of this reckoning that we're all trying to, to go against. And so I think this is the time where higher institutions really meet the bread and butter of it. And Call My Name Clemson is going to do that in classrooms, in different places, in different spaces. And so I'm really excited and, and just thankful to be here. So one of the questions that all of you have, and I will put this out because I feel bad. I, I My dad is a South Carolinian and that's a whole other thing. So I'm like, okay, he should have been on this call if he understands, <laughs> but he's from James Island. So the sea, con the sea islands there. One of the things that you came up with, I thought about what does it mean to be a seat at a table not just at the literal table, but in this table. Mm. And what do you hope that readers, like my students at Alabama and my current students at Davidson for this year, what do you want for them to know about you and the opportunity that you had and what they should take with them by being at this seat mm. at the table? I think that's a great question. I think it's when readers are reading this, you have to, authentically kind of put yourselves and be authentically empathetic and really try to understand um, what the narratives that are being told. I think storytelling is one of the most important pieces, one of the most, I think the greatest way we're able to tell each other's stories or tell histories is with storytelling. Um, and so when you're taking that seat at the table, I think that's when you're opening that first page of reading it. Um, and I think it's super important to really understand the lives of just what it is to be um, Black in the South. And I think it's a really very different thing than anywhere else across the country. And that's something that I've even really had the chance to really ponder on and think about a lot. And so this, this book gave me my seat at the table. And mm -hmm. so I think as a reader, you're taking that metaphorical seat. Um, but it's important that when you're taking it, um, to our allies and other people that you are here to understand, you're here to listen, um, you're here to gain a different perspective that's different than yours. So you're able to, you know, take it in and become um, the allyship that we want to go towards. So I think it's super important to be empathetic when we're taking this seat. Definitely, you're talking about witnessing and that witness and the, that virtual and what we have to, readers are gonna have to do. And your voice is what matters and it comes through the page. And just like, I know for all of yours, I was in tears <laughs> just reading because it's something to be brave and to tell these stories and be public and make yourself vulnerable. But 
the need to be a seat at the table because you are Clemson University. You're a part of this larger reckoning project and you deserve to be at that seat and others need to come on board because you're already there. <laughs> so Eric or uh, Monica, how, what does it mean for you to be in this collection and, and what do you want readers to take away if you can, Valerie? I just want to say something before um, Eric or Monica jump mm -hmm. in and about Thomas. Um, Thomas was a student when he wrote this piece. We were kind of reminiscing about that a little while ago. And I told him I, I wanted a student's voice in the book. And I spent a lot of time thinking about who that voice should be. And Thomas Marshall III is the only name that kept coming. I told him, I said he was the first and only name and I don't know why, but his his after we had met those couple of times and had had a chance to talk and run into each other, um, it just he just seemed like the person that needed to write that piece. And then when he wrote the piece and wrote about a seat at the table, I understood exactly why Thomas was the one to write that piece. I didn't know what he was going to write about, um, but it ended up he ended up expressing the very thing that I wanted a student to say, because one of the things at Clemson, whenever I do Clemson history work or call my name work, students are always at the table with me. And he said that so beautifully and eloquently and powerfully. And so I hope that students who read his piece will be inspired to, if they don't have that seat, demand it, mm -hmm. right? Demand a seat at the table, especially at the university, they need to be at the table. They need to, their voices need to be valued. Um, this is not about teaching teachable moments. You know, this is about learning with and from mm -hmm. our students. Oh, uh, so I guess we're, um, Eric uh, and Monica, we're going, we have a question that one of the things that I think all of us have, especially is being descendants. Um, other than demand the seat at the table, what kind of reparations should institutions of higher ed, whether it's Clemson, you um, and others should do, especially when we have legacy status mm -hmm. and legacy status being afforded to some? What can we do for this longer entrenched legacy that all of you have beautifully talked about? It's more than just one aspect, it's a lot more. What should we do for these descendants? And and make sure they have a seat at the table and with the structures that push them off the table, out of even the conversation. Well, my thought is um, for my descendants um, that they have a seat at the table by having free college education. Mm -hmm. I mean, we built them <laughs> along with many other institutions um, and buildings and just, we were the economy. It was on our backs. And so that our children can have those opportunities. That's the reparation. I'd love to have my school loans forgiven. <laughs> that would be absolutely, you yeah. know, wonderful. Um, but that's what I want for my descendants and for others. And the, you know, the many descendants of others that they be able to, that's a welcome table for them to say, hey, come on in. Your, your people have paid dearly for this. So this is what we would like um, to give back to you. And I was thinking that welcome table for me was the civil rights movement, uh, the black power movement. I sat at those tables and then it seems like the table disappeared. Now that's just my opinion, but I didn't feel so welcome after those days kind of, I mean, between killing, murdering, assassinating leaders, um, it took a lot you know, out of us. So this project puts the welcome table name um, back out there. Thank you, Thomas, for, for uh, making that analogy and writing that, that in fact, everyone is welcome to come and have a seat at the table. Eric or Thomas? Those are great points. Um, I'm definitely agree with a seat at the table uh, to scholarships. Um, but for me, um, the most important thing is just having that reconciliation, that acknowledgement, that um, you know, you know, allowing the community to 
see the support that you would give that you that you normally would give to the football team, the basketball team, any other organization within the university uh, to, to for them to come back out of um, where it's just not the university mm -hmm. to itself and then the community. Um, the community needs to be recognized. They need to be uh, accepted. They need to be openly accepted uh, by the university. And to me, those you know those things are you know along with uh, the scholarships um, and the seat at the table uh, are just paramount for me. Yeah, and one of the things I think all of you have come across and um, schools struggle with, and I hear it a lot, are the tours. Um, Thomas, your piece. Like I stumbled across this work because I am a student. My students shouldn't have to discover in a classroom. They shouldn't have to. So even changing the narratives that schools tell about this history and being upfront with it, that you're not stumbling across it across the way. So what can be the way the university markets this history, tells this history, being honest and not euphemizing the history in a way by hiding it? I think that's a great question because I think a lot of a lot of universities today are attempting to come with this racial reckoning that's kind of been happening since mm -hmm. the summer from the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others. Um, you have to truly put your put your money where your mouth is, as well as to be upfront and honest. So, if you are a university that you want to claim that you pride yourself on diversity and inclusive excellence, and this goes for any institution. You have to show that, um, and not just by diversity of flyers or putting certain people of color on different um, mm -hmm. marketing ploys. That means by actually creating sustainable, tangible ways to make pathways for Black students to succeed, not only succeed, but feel welcome, um, and create a space where it's it's actually welcoming, and you're, and you're being sustainable with it, and you're making sure that's in the terms of Black student organization funding, um, being sure that you're putting up this upfront history in your actual tours, not making it a secondary source, um, but just being upfront. And if that means that um, older white racist donors may leave, then I think you have to be okay with that because you have to claim and make that stake of what you truly believe in. And if that's inclusive excellence, you have to show it. Exactly. And since we're running out of time, Rhonda, would you like to close off with some parting words for this lovely discussion and conversation? I wish we had like another half hour. I know, ago. right? Um, <laughs> this always happens with, with Call My Name. Uh, feels like we're just getting started. Um, I, I just want to go back to a comment you made about how do we present this history to the public, right? To our campuses, to our communities. And I think the thing that I try and do is I'm just factual, you know, uh, for me, um, I just did a series for Clemson Athletics. And when we got to the end, um, about two weeks ago, I was talking with one of the co-organizers and she said, you know, we've been talking about some pretty difficult subjects over the past few months. And yet every week you came in and you just stated the facts and we had these challenging conversations and we learned a lot and now we're figuring out what's next. Cause I tell them, I'm like, look, I am not here to just um, provide you with knowledge and, you know, and to educate you. And so you can just check that off your list and say, okay, I got my call my name, you know, seminar or my call my name tour. So I'm good. I was like, oh no, call my name is a calling for you to respond. So what is your response? So I think at Clemson, what we are trying to do is incorporate this full narrative. If the trustees say they want to tell the complete history, then they cannot say we will not put the, the ages of the convict laborers on signs because we're uncomfortable with that, right? They cannot say that. That is not complete history. Um, in a recent meeting, you know, I told them some trustees were with us and I said, your history is misleading and incorrect it is still misleading and incorrect. We are not there yet. You cannot pat yourselves on the back yet. We are not there yet, right? And the big missing piece at Clemson is black history. And there are lots of people who are uncomfortable with it, who still think it's controversial. 
Um, but they will tell you every single thing about Thomas Green Clemson, except the fact that he was a Confederate Army veteran, except the fact that he owned his own plantation and sold people and took a boy named Basil with him to Belgium. They won't talk about that. It's only about Thomas Green Clemson Renaissance man. So it goes the other way as well. If we're going to talk about complete history means telling everything about everything and not whitewashing, sugarcoating any of the history and incorporating that into every aspect, right? If people come to campus, you know, if they don't want to hear the true story, then maybe they need to rethink about whether they want to come to Clemson because it's a part of who we are. We own it, right? We, we embrace it. We learn from it. We share it. We honor these people. Um, we do things for their descendants. We make sure that our students, you know, can take classes that help them to be, you know, global citizens that help them to be activist minded when they leave our university, when they're there and when they leave. Uh, I tell them, you need to know the history where you work, where you live, where you play, right? And once you know that history, again, what are you gonna do about it? If something needs to be done, you be the one, stop looking for other people to do the work, do it yourself right? Do it yourself. So call my name is a call to action. That when you learn this history, you must do something individually in your crew, right? In your neighborhood, you know, wherever you are, it can be a solo venture. It's better when it's in community for me. Um, pull together some folks and decide what you're going to do. And if everybody did that, this wouldn't take long. Too often it's on the shoulders of a few people that carry that heavy weight or it gets passed from one person to another. Um, at Clemson, I say everybody needs to be at that table Thomas talked about. Everybody, everybody has a role. So I hope that Call My Name uh, emphasizes the value of identity, of Everybody has a story and those stories deserve to be heard. They deserve to be shared, but we have to not just share the history, but we have to think about restorative justice. And I think that looks differently for every university, but that has to be a part of the conversation when we talk about slavery and its legacies in higher education, not just in the US, but around the world. So um, we are thrilled that you all came. I just wanna take a moment to thank Monica and Thomas and, um, and Eric for coming and Professor Green and for the University of Iowa Press for sponsoring this book talk. Um, it's thrilling to see this book in print and um, we hope that it will do a lot of good work in starting conversations around the world and, and, and pulling people right to the table. And then once you're at the table, what's the plan? Like what's the action plan to make sure that Call My Name resonates and empowers people to be engaged? Exactly. And I just want to say, Rhonda, thank you so much for doing this work, going against the institution and recovering these names and ensuring that these voices, the three that we heard today and everyone are heard, their history and that matters a lot. And for me, your work transformed my stuff and I, I hope we can continue to tell these stories and recover and you continue to get all the good work out there because this book is a force. And if people aren't reading this, they're not doing the work that needs to be done at institutions studying slavery. Yeah, and I do wanna just give a shout out to my university. Um, in recent years, <laughs> under a new president and provost, um, I have gotten extraordinary support. And more recently from my trustees, um, I, who I talk with on a regular basis, <laughs> something that I tell them I never thought would happen. Um, but we are trying to create something new at Clemson. Um, and that table that we're creating now is an inclusive table where we work collaboratively um, to ensure that uh, nobody's voice gets snuffed out and that people have a chance to, to weigh in on, on where we want Clemson to go next. So be encouraged. If, you, if this isn't happening at your university, just hang in there, write me, call me. Um, I'm happy to, to consult <laughs> and offer some advice as well.
Um, I just want to thank all of you so, so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. As you've probably seen in the chat, people are thanking you and already planning to use the recording in their classes to share with their students. So thank you for inspiring us. Rhonda, thank you so much for bringing your book to the Humanities and Public Life book series that the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies at University of Iowa shares with the University of Iowa Press. Um, the book is available. You can order it through the press website. Um, there in the uh, notice for today with your Zoom link, I think you got a link to a discount that will be available for a while, for the next month or so on the University Press website. And I just encourage you all to read this magnificent book, to share it with friends and share it with students and colleagues and with your university administrators who are looking for ways to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. This book hands them some wonderful opportunities. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our audience. I'll close by putting up a slide that has our um, co-sponsors for today, including um, Clemson, the College of Architecture, Art and the Humanities, along with the press and the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you to our speakers and thank you so much to our guests. Bye, everyone.